Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for taking time uh, to join us this afternoon. I'm Aram Sinreich from the Communication Studies Program at American University. And I am really delighted to bring you uh, this talk from this scholar. Um, this is somebody who I've known for a long time, even though she's still a relatively new scholar. Uh, she was actually my master's advisee at NYU uh, 12 years ago when I used to teach there. And even at the time, I thought she was an extraordinarily brilliant budding scholar with really innovative ideas at the nexus of technology, society, politics, culture, media. And uh, it's been my uh, distinct pleasure to watch her uh, develop her creative and scholarly approach to these subjects over the, the last decade or so as she got her uh, doctorate at McGill University in, uh, in Canada. And then uh, it's been wonderful to have her uh, as, a, uh, as a term faculty member in the Communication Studies Division at American University School of Communication for the past year. She's been a wonderful addition to our team. Our students absolutely love her. And if you don't already know her work, I think you're going to see why. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce my uh, colleague, Victoria Simon. Take it away, Victoria. Thanks, Aaron, for the warm welcome and for moderating this event today. Thank you so much to Matt Suklecki for organizing the event and the terrific work he's done there. And thanks to you all for being here. The title of my talk is On the Other Hand, Tactility, Music, and Marginalized Users. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my research on music touch screen interfaces and how they intersect with issues of social justice. So the research, uh, for this talk really comes from my book that I'm writing called From Difficulty to Delight in Archaeology of Musical Screens. And here I chart the history of music touch screens and the unknown influence that musicians, professional musicians, um, and as well as people with disabilities have had on the history of the touch screen. So um, I'm going to today only talk to you about like a few different case studies and uh, just uh, brief takeaways from the book. We're going to wind up with the iPad and we're going to begin with this uh, experimental music touch screen from the 70s, which from, who, invented by the composer Yanis Sinakis. And I believe that this interface is extremely important because it is the precursor for these, um, for the ubiquitous smartphone. So I'm really, really excited to share with you this research. And if you have any questions about any content, um, please feel free to ask me in the Q&A. <clears throat> so my work is very much embedded in the design justice uh, movement. And Sasha Cassandra Schock just wrote a book called Design Justice. And essentially what this is all about is how can we, um, how can interfaces and algorithms really be designed with these issues of issues, not issues, but with, um, through thinking about social justice and bias. And my work is very much motivated by these issues of marginalization of users and inclusivity. So the way in which I approach these questions is through this framework, um, where it's not just about outcomes, you know, whether or not the outcome of design is marginalizing or discriminating against users, but it's also about the narratives of the design. What stories are told about these interfaces and their benefits to users? What are the values that are encoded and amplified in user interface design? And 
how does social bias get fed through the design process? So not just at the ideation phase, but also at the user testing phase and also in the proof of concept phase. So ways in which social bias and broader cultural values get fed through the design process, um, it, there's, there's really many different approaches that we can take to this, uh, to this issue. And I tried to, to do a more multifaceted approach in my discussion of users. <clears throat> So the methods that I use to um, assess issues of social bias and inclusivity are archival. So for this particular research project, I went to the archives in France and Greece, the Xenakis archives, and looked at documents of how the touchscreen was, touch was sold to the public at that time. Um, also excavated documents about the sort of blueprints for these, for these designs and um, yeah, archives. Um, interviews, I, I interviewed developers as well as users. I did semi-structured long form interviews. I also did participatory ethnography. So not only did I, um, like for example, not only did I go to Berlin to interview the developers of music apps, but I also engaged in the user testing process myself. And I had them test their, their technologies on me in the same way they would test it on anybody else. I also do something called multimodal sensory design analysis. And if that means nothing to you, that's like completely fair. Um, what it means to me is that I engage in the technologies. I actually, I analyze them in terms of uh, their tactile, sonic and visual dimensions. Um, and I just kind of play around with them to analyze the interface design. I, this forms part of my ultimate scholarly research creation. So not only am I um, a, a scholar, but I'm also a sound practitioner. And I'm an intersectional queer sound practitioner. And this kind of, I, this sort of positionality in relationship to the research has really informed the questions that I raise in regards to the interface. So for example, um, uh, so yeah, so in terms of the questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion that I bring to the interface, uh, I, I came across these questions because I realized that not all people inhabit the designs of technology alike. And it is because of my research, because of my hands-on work with these interfaces and because of who I am, that I, uh, that, that's kind of what led me to the research in the first place. So now I'm gonna dive right into my first case study, which is the UPIC, which was invented in 1977 by Yanis Sanakis, a composer. And the UPIC was an interface that was designed to make something that was really quite bookish, um, quite academic, and uh, arguably boring, which is to say the process of learning a musical instrument and learning about electroacoustics, electroacoustics, sorry, and making it fun and tactile and impulsive. And I, I'm gonna let this, this guy is a composer from, uh, who is leading a workshop on the UPIC and this, he's demonstrating what the UPIC is. So I'm gonna let him explain it to you a little bit and then whatever he doesn't get to, I certainly will. For the musician using UPIC, the system consists principally of this graphics table. These control screens and these loudspeakers that relay the sound. Thanks to these elements, the user can converse with the system without having to bother about the electronic part behind this wall or the hundreds of programs that run it. Therefore, no technical competence is needed other than his competence as a musician in order to realize his creative gestures and he can work on his own. So what's interesting to me about this UPIC was that it's the first diversity initiative in music technology. And what was supposedly, uh, what Zanakis said that made it so diverse was that it was quote, universally intuitive. And the reason it was so universally intuitive was because the idea was that anybody can draw Right, and if anybody can draw, anybody can now create music. Uh, <clears throat> and it was framed as this empowering interface for the user, a fr framed as a way to uh, amplify the user's sense of agency here. And 
by that, I mean, here we have a, uh, this is from the user manual of the UPIC, which I found at one of the archives. And here it says, with the UPIC, the user does not need to have any computer knowledge. Everything goes through the hand which draws. So in effect, it's saying that, um, there, and it goes on to say that there's no pre-established like constraints or affordances within the interface design. It's this blank slate metaphor. Um, and, it, and here you see in all caps, it is the user who decides, right? So it's the user who has this amplified sense of control because they're effectively drawing in every aspect of the sound from micro to macro compositional structures. And here was an, um, this is from Zanakis's Zanakis journal, which essentially is saying that the heart and essence of sound is to be able to touch it with fingers. So this is from 19, in the 1950s. And Zanakis is thinking on tactile interfaces for music production actually stems, there's a long history of thinking about the relationship between a musician's connection to their instrument. So there's a long history of intellectual thought, Western intellectual thought specifically on this subject um, that I know of. And it is about this sort of this tactile connection and sort of romanticization of the way in which um, musicians interact with their instruments. And so for Xenopolis, the musician must be able to engage tactically to, uh, with the sound itself. And so Zanakis went on this mission to essentially show that drawing sound is something that anybody can do from any culture and that it is something that really uh, transcends all cultural barriers. It transcends anything to do with language, um, anything to do with ability, gender was something he also brought up. Um, and it was really this sort of universally intuitive interface design. And here he, he held demonstrations in various countries just to sort of prove that this interface could be used by literally anybody. And here is a photo that I found of one of the demonstrations that was in Japan. And here you have a Japanese uh, child who is using the interface. And there are tons of these when I was excavating and you know, looking through all these documents, I found so many journal articles about how uh, what the UPIC was able was enabling was that now children can like create symphonies, right? There was this idea that children could like, um, this was unleashing this hidden capacity of people to make music. But then I also interviewed users and they're like, no, no children were not making symphonies, trust me. <laughs> Um, a lot of users were, were definitely debunking this sort of this idea that was sold to the public about this uh, capacity of the interface. While children were used to uh, prove the system's capacity for universality, people with disabilities were also forefront, front and center in terms of the advertising of this technology to the public. And here what we have is, I'm about to show you some footage that I found of a documentary that was circulated widely um, in France, which shows the UPIC's capa supposed capacity for, um, to democratize music production. And I'm just gonna speak over it and I'll just give you my interpretation of what's going on here. This is a demonstration on blind users. And that's the UPIC, the drawing board. And here we have um, a blind person attempting to use the interface. And here's the composer Julio Estrada who's running the, the demonstration. And in fact, he that supposedly this interface was just, you can just easily impulsively use it, right? It was supposed to be totally intuitive. But here we have Julio Estrada literally taking this man's hand and maneuvering it and showing him exactly where to um, where to press the stylus so that he can actually operate the interface, right? The interface wasn't so universally intuitive as it was portrayed. 
And that's Zanakis. And he, there's another photo of him showing uh, children how to use the interface. But essentially, the what I'm what I'm attempting to describe to you here is that the UPIC presumed visuality as the dominant sense modality for interacting with the interface. Um, the user had to, in order to use interface, had to visualize sound. It was all about drawing and then seeing exactly where the, the pen left a mark on this particular, um, on the on the touch, on the drawing board. So the UPIC encoded this sort of, this visual interaction. Uh, it also encoded a very modernist avant-garde music genre, right? It would be impossible, nearly impossible to draw in a symphony. You can't just draw in a symphony with a pen. Um, it would take uh, probably years, in fact, to do so. In, in my interviews with users, that's exactly what they, they told me. And this sort of ties into my overall framing about the values and ethics in terms of the design process. So as Sasha Casenza Shock argues, those who are directly affected by the issues a project aims to address must be at the center of the design process. And Zanakis was really designing this interface for himself. He was designing it for, he was an architect. And so he was designing this interface because it was the way that he could naturally interact with sound. That is, it, it looked exactly like an architect's drawing board. And he then extrapolated from his own personal understanding of, the, of um, what is natural and assumed that this would be natural for everybody else. But as um, you know, many activists in the disability community have said, nothing about us without us. If people with disabilities are not really incorporated into the design process and it doesn't really, the idea for it doesn't stem from them, then this is not necessarily an interface that is designed for them. Um, and as Alice Wong has argued, some disabilities are visible, others less apparent, but all are underrepresented in media and popular culture. So while the UPIC in fact wasn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily meant for um, people for blind users, it what's important, it's not, it's important to sort of not throw away the contribution of the UPIC, which was to show that people with disabilities must be represented in any understanding of cultural democratization, any understanding of inclusive design. When I came across um, accounts of the these demonstrations with disabled users, I saw frequent quotes about how the system really harnessed this sort of innate capacity of blind users to create avant-garde music, which they otherwise wouldn't be able to attain. But it was sort of this understanding that blind people had this, this sort of natural born tendency to see things differently and very much in line with this avant-garde musical genre. Um, and that the system, you know, show that they, they would create these shapes that, you know, that other people or that, um, that able-bodied users would, nor would maybe wouldn't um, actually create. So it was a sense of othering of the blind users here, right? That they had this sort of innate capacity that was different than other people. Um, and that's really problematic because it really, it, puts a lot of pressure on, on people with disabilities to have this sort of innate capacity cr to create this experimental musical genre. But also it shows that their interactions with the interface can't really just be you know, mundane. Um, and in interviews with users, they, they actually spoke to the idea that we were all expecting you know, blind users to come up with this like crazy, you know, interesting sounds, but that you know, it sounded like everyone else. And so this sort of narrative about the interface is very much in line with assistive, uh, what Mary Mills calls assistive pretext, which is the resourcing of disability within technology and also when disability is used to hype a technology and then discarded for profit. So 
In my research on this interface, I found that assistive pretext was happening in two separate ways. One, that people with disabilities were in fact the inspiration for this, for the UPIC, um, yet written out of the history of the UPIC. And also, uh, the people with disabilities, as I just showed, were used to hype and promote and legitimize this particular interface. So deaf users have been central to the idea of visualizing sound, and um, which I will talk to you about in a moment. And blind users here were central to the cultural meaning of this touch screen. Maribel talks about the, this um, technology called the spectrograph, which was essentially a, a technology to visualize sound so that, and it was, one that was de developed in the 40s, and it was meant for um, deaf people to be able to visualize their speech patterns and in order to sort of uh, mold them, mold their speech into what they consider to be normal speech patterns. So the idea of even visualizing sound itself, which was central to the UPIC, actually was inspired by, um, by deaf people and deaf culture. The idea that the system should be um, inclusive of people with disabilities itself and the, the sort of cultural narrative around that came from the work of disabled uh, disability rights activists uh, in the 60s and 70s. So if it weren't for disability rights activists, this particular technology wouldn't have um, included people with disabilities in the cultural framing of the technology to begin with. So where is the UPIC now? Well, it is behind some brooms in a basement in the center, uh, the, what is it? The, sorry, the Center for Giannis Anakis in Rouen, France, where I did my archival work. And, but does that mean that we should just, you know, discard it? Does it mean that it isn't relevant anymore? Well, no, I would say that the UPIC is extremely relevant um, because it influenced uh, not only because of this sort of cultural meaning that attached to the interface in terms of this sort of universal design and um, idea that it was universally intuitive, but also because it influenced a very little known interface called the lemur. So this is a photo of the of Jazz Mutant's Lemur. Jazz Mutant was a company that produced this multi-touch touchscreen interface called the Lemur. And it was used by famous musicians all across the world. Here is a photo of uh, Daft Punk, the now defunct Daft Punk band using it in the Grammy, uh, the Grammy Award ceremony in 2008 for their song Stronger. Uh, we have Bjork using it, Richie Houghton, Nine Inch Nails, any number of people were using it at this time. And this was circa, you know, 2000, probably between 2005 and 2008. Um, and the iPhone came out in 2007. And so Apple um, claimed to have invented multi-touch, but certainly that wasn't the case. In fact, this is a, a use, a commercial use of multi-touch that was invented back in 2004. I'm not saying that Lemur invented it. In fact, a company I think called Fingerworks invented it but this was a commercial application of the technology prior to Apple. And I argue that the lemur was in fact proof of concept for the smartphone and the tablet technology, right? Like here we have musicians um, toting, the, toting this interface and sort of making it cool and showing that it could be used in this context. And <clears throat> I interviewed the developers for the, for the lemur, of the lemur. And they, they said that Apple was actually the, the first to purchase their device back in 2004. So I think that's pretty interesting. And what's also interesting, um, you know, yes, I believe that the lemur was sort of a little bit, it wasn't the direct inspiration, but it certainly was proof of concept, I believe, for Apple. But what's also interesting here, is that the lemur was supposed to be this sort of, I guess, like experimental interface, or at least the developers wanted it to be like that, but the users, as in professional musicians, didn't want that at all. They didn't want this sort of disruptive view 
uh, technology. They didn't want this, um, this like avant-garde interface. They wanted something very familiar. They really just wanted an interface that would look like the technologies that they were using all the time, which were like synthesizers or drum kits or whatever. They, um, and so they pushed for the interface design to, do, to use more skeuomorphic or um, metaphors for what they, what they were familiar with. So here we have a sense of user agency in the design process here. But like the UPIC, the, the lemur in fact also failed, failed many professional musicians as in my interviews with them, they said, yeah, it was cool, but it took away from the immediacy of working with the trigger finger. Um, uh, Nicholas Bouge, uh in my interview with him, he said with the lemur, you know, it wasn't, it took away from the real time. It was not quite as real time, not quite as fast. So for musicians, it was really hard to use the, the lemur in a professional context or in a performance context because, you know, it's really hard to interact with your audience when you're when you have to sit like just stare at the screen. And furthermore, there's this issue of muscle memory. Uh, in instrument design, like for example, in the piano or in a violin, you learn how to use the instrument through years of training by the sort of embodied knowledge that you gain with the instrument design. And without that kind of tactility, um, it's almost impossible to have that. So the, the lemur presented this really visual form of interface design, which failed the professional musicians who were using it in the same way that the visuality of the UPIC failed the blind users who were using um, the interface. And that's interesting also because as um, Gerard Gogan actually talks about the smartphone, when it, when it was first released to the public, it didn't have any sense of haptics, right? It didn't have um, vibrations, the sort of the vibrations that could be used to signal to people, um, you know, other ways in which other other ways in which to interact with the interface aside from just purely looking at the screen. Right. So when before the interface had any form of haptics, uh, it actually discriminated against a wide swath of people with disabilities. And yet, as we see here in this quote, it is touted as this great equalizer. The, the touch screen here is touted as a way to include technophobes, kids, senior citizens, people with visual or hearing impairments. Um, suddenly users could just navigate their phones with a few swipes of a finger. Kids intuitively seem to know how to use it. And I guess there's that, so there's that word intuitive that I, I do find problematic because not everyone can intuitively use this interface and to sell it and to create this, paint this, paint this narrative around it as universally intuitive and accessible, I believe is very problematic in the same way that the, the, the smartphone isn't intuitive to all, just in the same way that the UPIC was not intuitive for all either. And so I argue that this idea of simplicity does not necessarily mean that a technology is inclusive. Just because it's supposedly easy to use doesn't mean that it is accessible. Um, so in the recent work I do on uh, music app developers and the way in which they configure users in the design process, each of the de developers I interviewed argued that their particular design, because of the use of small, smart algorithms and the way in which they prevented the user from making mistakes, would be designed for, quote, everybody, anybody, and regular people. And in including this, this idea of everybody, right, this sort of universal user, they also describe these interfaces as fun, quote, positive experiences, right? And the reason they say it was positive was because it prevented the users from making mistakes. So if the user can actually fail in terms of their engagements with the interface or make fail in terms of like making a mistake, then, you know, that would be synonymous with this idea that it was fun and inclusive. And I, and I use queer theory and also disability studies to kind of 
poke holes in this idea of this positive experience as universally fun, right? Um, just because the just because an engagement produces a outcome of you know perhaps positivity, meaning that like the user isn't isn't um, pre, isn't I guess interacting in some sort of erroneous way with the um, with the music app, for example, it doesn't you don't hear any uh, any notes that might sound or sound not in line with like a you know a pop song or whatever it is. Um, I argue that this idea of positivity and fun is very much gendered. It's very it comes from a very heteronormative place, and also it's ableist. Um, it is ableist insofar as it presumes that what people want is this experience of musical ability. What people want is this kind of human perfectibility, this idea that everything um, should feel like it's affirming the user's sense of self and affirming themselves as this wonderful musician. And so I argue that like the UPIC and also like the Lemur, these presumptions um, about this ideal of uh, user experience is really based on sort of idealized and universalized conceptions of users that are broadly based on and derived from the self-image of the designer. When a design is not tested on the community of users in which it is designed for, and when a design really stems from a more theoretical perspective, the design ends up reinforcing the sort of habits and subjectivity of the designer. And this is something that has been spoken about in the field of science and technology studies. Uh, it's a term called I methodology, right? So these designers are, while they say they're designing for everyone, are in fact designing for themselves. So in my work, I use um, queer theory and disability studies to envision different norms in technological design. And I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions that you may have about that in the Q&A. So thus far, I have um, so far, in sum, uh, here are the themes that I have discussed today: uh, the untold history of how disability rights activists and musicians were central to the cultural formation of the ubiquitous smartphone and tablet; how disabled users are socially marginalized, but yet central to the history of many important technologies; and how simplicity is not inclusivity. And I critique uh, the, this idea for, that it is an ableist discourse. And the stories that we tell about inclusive technology design and ideas about user agency and universal design. And I believe that's all. Oh, no, there's more. <laughs> so my research goals in general are to challenge the normative and ableist presumptions that do circulate around these ideas of universality, to identify how technology and its surrounding cultural discourse can be informed by more anti-oppressive political principles, and also to promote diverse norms. And I'm very excited to hear any questions that you may have. And thank you so much for listening and watching and reading. And um, yeah, I'm just very excited to talk to you all about my research. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Vicki. That was, that was fantastic. And um, this is one of those cases where I wish we had like, you know, Maybe nobody else would stick around, but I wish we had like four hours to, to delve into all of the different threads that you've woven together here. So given that we have a limited amount of time, let me jump in uh, and try to encapsulate the, the whole Megillah in one question. Um, so what I think is most interesting about your work, and I come, you know, I'll acknowledge my bias as somebody who's interested in social justice, technology, and music, uh, as you are, um, you point out this very, uh, this genealogy that exists both in uh, the musical field and in the tech field, which is this, um, this, this development of the tool set uh, from a, a very highly specialized um, interface uh, to a more uh, accessible, ostensibly accessible one, right? In, in, the, in the field of music, you know, when we think back to like, the, the early 19th century and, and the spread of the piano across middle-class homes all around the Western hemisphere, the whole argument there was for democratization. It's like, you don't need to be a fancy uh, opera goer. You can have a whole orchestra in your own house, just play this piano. Anyone can do it if you have 10 fingers, right? And then 
when the phonograph comes along uh, a century later, at, at the turn of the 20th century, you have who needs a, 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 a piano? Like you don't need, you don't have to, uh, you know, practice for years to have world-class piano playing in your home. You can just put on one of these shellac discs and you'll get to listen to whatever concert pianist you want, right? And so on and so forth on through Spotify and beyond. And you get the same thing with tech, right? You begin with this, you know, these, these uh, whole floor, you know, office computers that require uh, a, a tremendous amount of training and multiple operators just to do a simple command. Then you end up with a personal computer revolution in the 1970s. Uh, and then you end up with the kind of graphical user interface uh, and ultimately the web in, in the 1990s. And then, you know, um, tablet and smartphone uh, platforms, which as you point out, are themselves derivative of music interfaces, right? And so both of these fields have this very well-documented narrative that has accompanied the development of the interface. Uh, and that narrative is all based around, as you point out, universality and uh, accessibility. But you do such a great job of, of, of demonstrating that this move towards accessibility is a move away from inclusivity. The more ostensibly universal the interface becomes, the more it presupposes some kind of normative end user, which structurally excludes people who are already socially marginalized and vulnerable. Um, so I guess I don't expect you to have the silver bullet here, but, but how do you see using some of the tools that you've used like queer and disability theories and, uh, and more robust testing as a way out of this double bind, is it possible to actually develop an interface, either technological or cultural uh, or both, that is simultaneously accessible and inclusive? Uh, thank you for that wonderfully worded question, Aram. Um, yeah, uh, I think as you point out that certain ideas about universality, right? The idea that we can actually include every single user in some sort of um, understanding of interface design, this also may not be possible, right? Like this idea of universality or, or universal design, we can, sometimes we can think about this, like it's a very nice idea and people should be perhaps designing for, um, people should be designing for marginalized users in, in mind, absolutely. But it is an, sort of an ever receding horizon because you can't actually anticipate all user needs. It, that's something that you know it has to happen on the ground. It has to be everything like you have to be constantly testing on like different user groups. And there is no such thing, I think, as one sort of completely accessible um, interface design. Uh, but that said, there are ways in which designers can also design for, and uh, communities of users can interact with designers to create interfaces that may um, present themselves in ways that may sort of attend to the, the user's needs, right? So for example, so what I think, when I think about queer theory um, and ways in which we can use queer theory to rethink the sort of the norms and assumptions of design, I'm thinking more about issues such as like, you know, queer affect, like ways, of, like ways of getting around this this norm that like fun means immediate pleasure, that kind of thing. And like, what is pleasure? What is fun? Whose fun is inscribed into that interface, right? And if you're not testing on the community of users or on the diverse community of users, or if you're not incorporating, say, for example, queer users in the idea and design of the interface, you're going to get one, you know, you're going to get a designer who is probably going to be a white able-bodied man um, who is hetero, like heterosexual, you know, thinking about what it is they find fun, right? So can, and, can, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, so it's designing, the issue here is really designing from this highly theoretical point of view. And when you're not incorporating the community of users in which you're trying to serve, um, in various phases in meaningful ways, then you're invariably going to get this um, the end, this idea of the end user as, you know, um, one that you may not want. <laughs> so, so do you think that, um, you know, one of the things that uh, audience studies uh, and STS scholars have done a lot of work on in the last 20 years is showing how sometimes it's not the, sometimes 
the affordances that are engineered into an interface by the designers are not used in the way that they would have expected. Uh, or uh, sometimes there are secondary affordances that they weren't even uh, completely aware of engineering into the interface that themselves become generative of new uses, new cultural ideas, and open the, the, the technologies up to new audiences. Can you think of uh, like a good example of how, for instance, a, uh, a, 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 sit, a cishet designer may have created a technology that would have found a secondary application with, uh, with queer users? Or how it, an able designer would have found, developed something that had secondary applications with disabled users? Yeah, I mean, what, what comes to mind right now, um, and I believe uh, Jai Verdi just wrote about this, is the, the new uh, Nike sneaker that just came out. Um, there, there's these sneakers that actually allow you, that actually put themselves on you so that you don't have to tie laces or anything like that. So, and who is this kind of sneaker good for? It's good for people perhaps, you know, who don't even have, who don't have hands. Um, and these sneakers right now, which are very like mainstream with like, you know, my friend just got one. Uh, these were designed by like, and for people with disabilities. Yet at the same time, the rep, the sort of the framing of it in the popular discourse, like nobody really knows that. <laughs> so right. like, disabled populations were very much there in the, in the design process um, and were written out of the cultural framing of, of the sneaker. So why, I think why that, do you think that is? Well, I think the reason that is, is because, I mean, the way it's framed right now is that like we, it's, you know, Nike cares about accessibility, but the, the word disabled doesn't show up anywhere. And it's not really at the foreground of the, of the, the tech design. So, um, I think that's because disability still has a stigma attached to it. And so you think Nike is afraid of tarnishing their brand by associating themselves with disabled customers? Yes. And so they have to- And that, and that also kind of ties into um, what I was talking about before with, uh, with assistive pretext, right? Here we have people with disabilities as the direct inspiration um, for this sneaker. Uh, which, by the way, when you were talking about how users um, were sort of looking at these technologies and perhaps uh, wanting them, wanting either to design them differently or to incorporate their own feedback in it, users, like in this particular example, wrote in and asked Nike to change it. <laughs> so to change the messaging. To change to change the the way in which you can put the sneaker on your foot. Um, so. You know, that's a way in which like uh, people with disabilities were sort of in a sense, like, I don't know, remixing the sneaker, I don't know. <laughs> well, establishing this feedback loop, certainly with the, with the designers, right? Which is, which is maybe uh, part, of, part of your broader answer to how can we square that circle between accessibility and inclusivity is like, well, of course the end users are part of the design process. Right, this this whole notion of like the and this is I think where your your invocation of remix theory is really useful, is like this notion that there is like a a, a linear supply chain that goes from resourcing a product to kind of post consumer waste just in one direction is an absurd idea that has no place in in uh, certainly in a networked post industrial uh, environment. Right. Yeah. So so why not bring various communities. Uh, with very different needs and perspectives and expertise into the design process through these feedback loops. Yeah, and it will yeah. invariably make it, you know, make the design better. You know, if you're incorporating people with disabilities or incorporating people like you're, first of all, you're actually interacting with the community. Um, so it's not like you're it's stemming from your own idea of what is, what the, what the community actually wants, but then you're going to, you know, design for, different form, like different needs, you know? And I think that's great. Like you'll, you'll have more of a grounded sense of design as well. And of course, creating these new affordances in turn spurs more unexpected uh, kinds of adoption. For instance, um, my, my wife, Dania, who's watching this 
uh, your presentation just texted me from her office uh, and said, you know, those sneakers sound like something that would be great for new moms, right? And yeah. so, yes, they might be designed for somebody who doesn't have hands that can tie a shoe, but they might also be great for somebody whose hands are busy holding uh, an infant. Absolutely. And I think um, Graham Pullen has a theory called resonant design in his book. It's called, uh, I think, Design Disability and Design is his book. And it's essentially that a lot of times when, you know, when designs are for people with disability, there can, it can also resonate with like main, like with other populations of users. Like for example, curb cuts, right, are good for um, people in wheelchairs, but they're also good for people riding bikes. Right. Or, um, you know, closed captions, great if you're um, like working out in the gym. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I'm a frequent user of closed captions and, and I have fairly decent hearing for a middle-aged person um, who's been playing the bass very loud for half his life. Um, so uh, maybe I don't have such good hearing, actually, now that I think of it. Um, so uh, we have a couple of good questions in the Q&A. I want to ask you about one more thing that I felt like was an interesting thread in your work that you only mentioned in passing, which is this idea of skeuomorphism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is this design principle that uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, that, that Dr. Simon talked about, that basically when a new interface is created, tries to make it similar to the old interface so that people will feel comfortable transitioning to the other. And back in the dot-com year, used to talk about um, the way that uh, cars were, when cars were first marketed, instead of steering wheels, they had buggy whips so that people who were used to driving horses and buggies would be able to drive their cars, right? And that was like a really popular metaphor back then. You don't hear it so much these days. But, but I think the more recent version, of course, is that there are early versions of, um, of iOS the, you know, the iPhone operating system had all, you know, like the notepad looks kind of like a physical notepad right, and had like a, a, a texture on it and lines and stuff like that. And then at a certain point, they were like, no more, no more skeuomorphism. Let's make everything look more inherent to what it is. And I think that that happens with all new media. And, you know, you think about like Lev Manovich talks about like remediation, how like all new media are interpreted through the lens of the media that they are replacing and supplanting and, and augmenting. So can you talk a little bit about how you see the skeuomorphic principle as being a kind of Trojan horse for bias? Like what kinds of bias can get built into, into that design, even though it's trying to be assistive? Again, like I, what I like about your framing is that you're not talking about like evil thoughtless designers just being sexist and racist and ableist. You're talking about people trying to make things accessible and universal, but reproducing their own inherent biases in a way that achieves the opposite which I think is such an important framework of critique. So, so do you see that in skeuomorphism? Like how, how does that work in that context? Super interesting point, Aram, about skeuomorphism and accessibility, which is not something I actually, um, I, that's not something that like I have considered, but it's totally relevant because, you know, what ends up being represented visually in interface design is usually coming from dominant culture, like, you know, dominant hegemonic culture. Um, and for example, you know, like notepads, that kind of thing, as you mentioned. So if it's coming, if whatever gets sort of used isn't something, you know, in terms of these, these visual metaphors for, um, for physical uh, technologies, isn't something that really appeals or is relevant for, for example, for marginalized users, then that in itself is extremely biased. That's extremely socially biased. Um, and you end up usually getting probably the typical, what is most typified in any particular, um, in any particular cultural practice. That's, that's the thing, that's the technology that ends up getting represented in interface design. So yeah, um, so much potential for bias with skeuomorphism. And like, yeah, I'm gonna end up writing about that. So thank you. Yay, well, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I, I know that Nancy Bame, uh, our, our mutual friend and person that we admire, was doing some work on the skeuomorphic uh, Microsoft operating system, Bob, mm -hmm. which was from the mid nineties, which, which uh, is, I think it actually began as Melinda Gates' this idea, not Bill's. And it was supposed to make the desktop look like a living room. But I remember at the time being like, 
I've never lit I'm like this. Like, I feel like I've just been invited into someone's mansion. You know, there's like a blazing fire and an armchair, and, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think your, I think your take is, is absolutely right. Um, so, we have a question. Sorry, go ahead. It's so great because, okay, so about, I, I might be giving a talk on, um, I think in the music, uh, American Musicological Association, actually about this issue of skeuomorphism as a conservative approach to um, musical interfaces. And I'm going to talk about the lemur, my example of the lemur. Um, but yeah, like it is really, it's really politically conservative in the way that you just kind of talked about. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, so Tony Harvin asks, do you think people with disabilities who are active runners in this case want to be labeled disabled? I think he's talking about the, the Nike example you talked about. Or will they, the disabled users, be more receptive of a product that's framed as accessible, right? Um, sorry, let me. Yeah, sorry. Let me let me re repeat that. So so Tony's trying to get into this, in, into the kind of messaging that surrounds splitting the difference between accessibility and uh, and oh, well, yeah. what you talk about is about the difference between simplicity and inclusivity, right? Yeah, so, no, I think that I think what I'm sorry, Tony. Um, Tony Harvin. Tony Harvin. Uh, that's an excellent question because I think you're getting at this idea, do people with disabilities want to be labeled exactly as disabled? I think that, you know, I think that there is probably tons of different, there's lots of people who are disabled and people with disabilities who may want to be defined in terms of culture, culturally disabled uh, and like identify with like a community of um, other people with disabilities as well. But then I think there's also people who don't <laughs> Um, and I don't know if there's any kind of way to sort of, I, I, I just don't know. I think that like, there's probably like any other community of people, there's any number of um, ways to think about disability and ways to think about identity in relation to, in relation to disability. So, you know, that's, I, I would say that's not really my call. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, let me ask you, uh, I, I, I think that we only have another seven minutes, so uh, I, I'm interested. Disability is a bad word. That's how, it, that's kind of, you know, a lot of people are like, well, just, you know, disability or di differently abled and, you know, trying to like get around it, but the, no reason why disability should be something that people are ashamed of. Agreed whole, wholeheartedly. Um, so uh, let alone the brands that serve them. Um, so, so I, I, I want to know a bit more about your path into this, right? So you identify as a queer female musician technologist scholar, right? Which is, a, I think, a very um, useful position to come into this field. But like any scholar, you only inhabit the position that you inhabit, and you have to infer other people's um, perspectives on the same issues. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about how your experience as a, as a music producer using technology led you into this set of questions? Like, what was it about the world that you encountered that made you say, man, I need to research this. Something is not adding up. Absolutely, that's a great, I mean, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of things. Like, for example, I was using um, multiple forms of interfaces, multiple commercial interfaces, um, and noticing, you know, certain similarities that they would have, for example, the MIDI piano roll and, you know, the linearity of the interface. Um, <clears throat> and these were things that I didn't really, you know, at first I was like, okay, I have to really, you know, I have to adopt to this particular interface design, but I'm like, but why am I feeling so constrained right now? You know, and also there's so many clear cultural assumptions that are encoded into this interface design, like from a very European, um, musical perspective. And this was quite clear to me, not even having any kind of, you know, culture theory knowledge, just like, you know, playing around with these interfaces and being like, well, is this, you know, my quote, authentic expression or is this really coming from the, the software itself? And so I got really, you know, excited about the idea of critiquing um, this, these sort of, these interfaces through like by under, understanding that the fact that it was probably they're probably made by like white men you know who have a very like you know European perspective on things and 
you know, how can we design interfaces that are mal that are, are alternative or perhaps, you know, approach the um, approach music from a like subaltern perspective in some sense, right? Um, and yeah, I just kind of, and then for the music app stuff that I work on, a lot of it was that, you know, the advertising was like, anybody can use these interfaces. And when I was playing around with it and they're like, and they're so fun. And I'm like, this isn't fun at all. Like, not at all, you know, <laughs> like this is, you know, I, I swipe a few, like I press a couple of buttons and I'm creating this kind of like musical masterpiece. And like this sort of affirmation of myself is supposed to be, um, you know, in, like this, it just wasn't, it just didn't do it for me. <laughs> I always felt that way about Guitar Hero. Um, but and, and, uh, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. So, so my friend Cornel Cornelia Brunner, who also identifies as a queer female uh, tech researcher and interface researcher, uh, I remember she went to maybe it was CES 2005 or something. She, the first time that Nintendo displayed the Wii, uh, you know, which was the first major console system that had these kind of wireless positional controllers. And she said, we said, what did you think of it? And she said, um, it's the most female interface I've ever seen. And she meant this, you know, from a feminist perspective, like this was this incredibly powerful you know, uh, de democratizing liberatory, you know, that no longer were you using presumably the phallic joystick, but, but there was something inherently female about, about that platform and, and that, that style of interface. And I've always thought that was a really interesting comment, uh, but I'm not sure whether it's true. Do you think that an interface can be coded with gender that directly or is it or or does the, the does the coding come more from the interaction between the designer and the end user mm, that's a really that's a really good question um i don't i don't think so because i don't think that you can really essentialize gender either way um you know i think that that joystick that you're talking about sounds very like it's symbol it's very symbolic of something you know, and I think it's more of a cultural construction of the technology rather than some some sort of uh, you know encoded way in which identity like happens. I think it's all performance. Um, I think it's all performance and construction. And yeah, I do think that there are certain things that you can design for. Like for, when I talk about queer queer theory as it relates to design. You know, I'm talking about ways in which queerness has been culturally constructed in ways in which affects such as like discomfort or um, failure or these kinds of uh, experiences like irritation, annoyance, that kind of thing. That is a queer experience, not because queer people are annoyed, you know, or because queer people like innately feel this sort of discomfort, but that's a cultural construction of queerness. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a straightforward answer for that, but that's that's my thinking on it right now. Well, as promised, uh, we only uh, began to, to plumb the depths of, of your research here. I think it's just phenomenally interesting, valuable, important, uh, generative stuff. I can't wait to see the book that you are writing. Uh, and thank you so much for spending the hour with us and, and spending your, your year with American University School of Communication. It's, it's great to have you uh, be a member of our team. Thank you, Aram. It's a delight to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. And let's definitely talk soon. <laughs> for sure. Uh, Matt, back to you if you want to close things out. 